So I finished the gathering storm and it was insane. Let's hop right into the biggest storyline and maybe the best ending to a book so far. So we have the destruction of Grendel. Not only does he destroy Grendel's tower and her, but he also destroys every single person who is in that tower. Now granted, they were probably under compulsion, but the ruthlessness of it, the recklessness of it, and really just the lack of empathy or worry about anything that's going on except for murdering Grendel is really worrying. And I started to think that this is a low point for Rand, but I was completely wrong because lower points were to come several pages later. The next low point is different and I would say scarier. So in Arad Doman, a ton of things go wrong. Now, all of the grain spoils and that's essentially, in my opinion, because Rand has been touching the dark side of um, the power, the Dark One's power, essentially. And it just turns every single piece of food to ash. And people have gathered there thinking the Dragon Reborn is going to save them, lead them to victory, give them food. And when he finds out that all the food is spoiled, he runs away. He runs through um, a window and travels and just gets out of there and just leaves them to die. And not only was this ruthless because he thinks there's nothing more I can do for these people, it was so full of cowardice that it was just shocking to see. And we went from Grendel's murder, which I thought was a low point, to the just absolute, what's the word I'm looking for? The abandonment of Arad Doman, which hurt even more. And I thought, you know, that must be the low point. But I was wrong. There's more. Next up, we get a scene where Rand sees Hurin, who we haven't seen since, I think it's the second or third book. And Hurin thought Rand was awesome. He's one of the first people to properly believe in Rand. And what does Rand do? He manhandles him with the power. He lifts him up, he shakes him, he scares him. And just having the descriptions of Hurin's face, going from like believing in this person this sweet young boy two years ago that he met and was one of the first people to really truly believe in um, to this just menace, this desecrator, this ruthless, disgusting, cold person who he is now. And you could just see it was kind of like a, a son whose father had scorned him and it was just, it was hard to read. So I thought that was the new low, but no, then just because the Borderlanders aren't where they said they were going to be and simply because they wanted to meet Rand in, on safe terms in uh, Far Madding. And is that ideal for him? No, obviously not. But they just don't want to be destroyed. And he threatens to rain fire on them. He threatens to murder probably hundreds, if not thousands of people just to get some respect. And I thought, wow, this must be the low point, right? We've had four or five in a row. But wait, there's more. And the next one hurt a lot. I thought that Tam was gonna be the catalyst for Rand coming back to the Rand that we know. I thought that maybe he was gonna be able to bring Rand back and it kind of looked like they were making progress, but then what happens is Tam brings up Cad Swan and the Aes Sedai and that just triggers Rand like crazy because although I do really like Cad Swan, you know, they all are trying to manipulate Rand. They're trying to get them to do what he has to do because he does have to do it. And although they do have his best interests at heart, he's just been hurt so many times. Put in the box is the way he describes his hurt because the first time he really was put in the box. But then after that, it just feels like it over and over again, metaphorically to him. And the low point, what I think is gonna be the absolute bottom is he threatens Tam. He threatens his own father, the person who brought him up, the person who is, as everyone describes, a rock, a sturdy man, someone you can trust, and he threatens him with the power. He's gonna kill him. And then he opens up a window and he goes to Ebu Dar. And I thought in Ebu Dar we were about to get the lowest of lows. I thought that even though he could see that the Shun Chan, do they suck? Yes, they suck. Collaring people, not okay. But the rest of the civilization and how they run it seems to be really good. It seems to be uh, a lot of freedoms if you can't channel um, and an ability to build a new life. And people seem to be happy that they invaded because they're mostly, it doesn't impact their lives that much. There's law, they can crack on. And Rand sees all of this and he notices. And I think he, I thought he was still going to try and destroy Tuon and others with uh, Balefire. And then he, just hits a new level of crazy and he jumps about the world and then he ends up on Dragon Mount. And on Dragon Mount, we get a beautifully written scene where essentially Rand 
has an epiphany, has a moment of clarity, he gets enlightened and he accepts that Luz Theron is he and he is Luz Theron and that they must do this journey again, sees the beauty in life and really understands his why. And I'll be honest, initially, I was really underwhelmed. I was underwhelmed because I thought there was gonna be a bigger solution. So I went back and I read the, the scene again, the four or five pages before his final revelation. And I liked it a bit more. And then I went back and I read it again and I loved it. And I think that I was really looking for like some kind of magical explanation, some kind of banishing of loose there in some kind of magic to come in and fix him. But once again, the groundwork laid by Jordan and then really well finished by Sanderson surprised me. It was, it was, it was great. It was elegant. And the more I thought about it and the more I read the scene, the more I realized that there, there can't be another answer. Like the, the clarity, the truth is always within. And um, it was beautiful. I loved it as a revelation. And I loved what it means moving forwards um, because it opens up a lot of storyline moving forwards now. And there's different options. The Rand that we had, that, we, we, that I thought we were gonna have until the final battle, there's not that many options for that guy. He's very predictable. You know exactly what he's gonna do, how he's gonna do it. He's gonna do the most ruthless, effective thing possible uh, with no regard for anyone or anything, especially not even really his own safety. The only things he cares about is destroying the Dark One. And that's quite a linear story. So it opens up a lot and it was absolutely beautiful. But it did take me a couple of reads. You know, I think I was kind of addicted to the, the magical aspect of things, the mystical aspect of things, and um, forgot how beautiful the storytelling is when it really is development and the answers come from within. So, bravo. So, what storylines does this open up? It opens up reunification storylines. It opens up apologies. It opens up love. It opens up laughter. And it opens up him attempting to fix a lot of the things that he wasn't going to try and fix when he was feeling how he was before. So, Arad Doman, I'll be very disappointed if he doesn't go and find a solution for them. You can't be a coward and just leave them all to die. That's a whole area. I know the last battle looms, but that's not what a leader does. Now, two on. Initially, I was leading towards him going and being like, whatever it takes, I'm gonna kneel to this woman, and then I'm gonna lead everyone in the last battle. But the other big thing that happened in this book with the Aes Sedai, which we're going to discuss at length in a minute, I just think that makes it impossible. I don't think you can do that and then have Rand uh, knowing as many Aes Sedai as he does and loving so many of them, Nynaeve, Egwene, Elaine. Um, I don't think you can do that. So what does that open up? I think, I think there's no way that Rand can bow down. So will there be time for some attacks on the Sean Chan. I don't think all out war is gonna happen. There has to be, um, there has to be one submits to the other. And I do think the Sean Chan are gonna to submit to Rand. And I hope they do after that attack on the tower, but I don't wanna to say too much about the tower right now. And although I hated ruthless, soulless Rand, I do hope that we go back to like a middle ground. I don't want him to go and try and please everybody every time and be afraid of uh, women dying for him who are willingly going out there and putting their lives on the line like, um, I don't know, like Aes Sedai, for example, or his uh, maidens. Like I would like a, a middle ground where he understands he is the dragon, his job is extremely important, he must protect himself and he must make the right decisions for everyone as a whole. But I also want him to keep a hold of his humanity, to laugh, to care about his friends and to put love in those, you know, maybe not first, but maybe second, you know what I mean? Like they must win, but you know, love is important as well. And doing the right thing is really important. So I hope we get a middle ground round. And I think we will, like what was the point of all this development if we don't get an improved round? We can't just go backwards to, um, well, I don't know if that would be backwards, but we can't go back to the, the, the foolish and foolhardy loving boy that we had before. So I think we're gonna get a, a beautiful in-between and an extremely effective leader that I can love. That's what I'm hopeful for. Other things that happened in that storyline. So number one, we got Khad Swan low-key humbled by Tam when she picked him up with the power. And I can't remember exactly what he says, but he says something along the lines of um, a bully always resorts to violence or um, physical strength or something like that first. And you can tell that annoyed her. And that was awesome. I love that little two rivers win for Tam. Because I do like Khad Swan, but is she a bully? Yeah, I would have to agree that she is a little bit of a bully. Um, it feels different, her bullying, because I feel like she's just trying to use the most effective way 
to be useful and doesn't really care too much about people's feelings and emotions. Not in the same way Rand was, you know, that's a whole different level. But uh, yeah, I've like I've said in every video, I do like Katsuan a lot, but I'm not above watching her be humbled. That was beautiful. I really enjoyed that. And I do think she needs that. The other thing is we realized that three shall be as one. And what that means is two people, two women are gonna have to channel with Ran to use Kalandor effectively because he destroyed the Choden Cal, I think it's called, which is big, you know, he got rid of his most powerful weapon um, and he's gonna use Kalandor. So I think there's two options. So we either have Egwin and Nynaeve, I think he trusts definitely Nynaeve enough to do that or Elaine and Avinda. Um, I don't think Min can do it because she can't channel, right? So, you know, I feel like, and I feel like that wasn't her purpose to the story. Her purpose to the story was to keep Rand grounded, but also her visions. Like that's, you know, that's her big superpower there. So is it going to be Nynaeve and Egwin or is it going to be Elaine and Avinda? I think it has to be Elaine and Avinda. And the reason I think it has to be Elaine and Avinda is because what was the point of all these long, sometimes tedious, nearly always uh, passionate romances if there's not some big culmination, uh, you know? Because he's not even hanging out with those two any, anymore. He's only hanging out with Min. So that feels like something that has to happen at the, the final battle is for him to submit and allow those two to, to, you know, put the power through him or however that's going to work with Kalendor, obviously link up together. So that is my prediction, Avinda and Elaine and Ran together. However, if it's Egwin and Nynaeve, it will be very poetic, but I just think they're such leaders in their own right that... I don't think their destiny should be tied like that closely to Rand. Whereas Elaine and Avinda, are they leaders of people? Yeah, Elaine's queen of Andor, but they just don't have the same two rivers stubbornness. They, they weren't with us from the very beginning. I feel like Egwin and Nynaeve deserve their own finale, so to speak. So then we move to the White Tower and I want to start with Varen. And where I want to start is just by saying, ah, oh, Varen. I would absolutely love to hear Varen's story. Last uh, video, I asked everybody of any character, whose story would you like to hear more of? And now that I've read that final scene or what I think is gonna be the final scene of Varen, it was so beautiful. I would love to know more about her. I would read a saga about how she planned on studying the Dark One and studying the dark side of things and then obviously kind of got found out and put into a corner, having to swear, having to do just enough to convince them and convince her own oaths that she was on the dark side, but still and gather as much intelligence and help people out. And I had a feeling that Moiraine knows about it, by the way. Just what a storyline. Very, very Professor Snape, but on a much grander scale and less intimate because we spend less time with Varen as well. Um, and for a better reason, Professor Snape was in love. Varen just, I suppose she was in love as well, in love with the right thing and in love with just learning, which is just awesome. What an awesome storyline and a, a brutal yet beautiful ending as well. And that raises a lot of questions about what she gave on the note to Matt. I still don't really have any idea. I, I thought maybe it was something to do with Moiraine. Potentially she knows, she knew like where Moiraine was and wanted to prompt Matt to do that. Maybe it's information about the dark side in case she failed to tell Egwene. Um, yeah. But if it's information about the dark one and the dark side, Matt could take that really wrong. I don't know. I'm very interested to find out what's on that note. So then of course we move to the attack of the Sean Chan. And you know, I thought with Rand, we'd had enough excitement and craziness, but we have this as well. So I'm gonna hop right to it. The Sean Chan are attacking. Egwene has managed to gather some novices and when she picks up the Sangriel from the stores and she's, she's like, we get a monologue from her almost and it's like, not this time, I'm gonna make sure it goes my way. And it just gave me chills. It's one of the few times I've gotten chills from this book, uh, from this series, sorry. Although there's been many amazing moments, you know, to physically get chills, it has to be something special from a book. Um, it was just absolutely incredible. Like it, it just got me so pumped, so fired up. And then we have those scenes where she's essentially on the 22nd floor, I think it was, of the of a broken white tower. So what a metaphor for what she's been working towards anyway. And she's linked with all the novices or as many as you can link with. And she has the Sangriel and all of the beatings that she's taken, she's now administering. And there's this tie 
to all the way back in like the second or third book when she gets leashed. So she's channeling that anger, that power, all of the helplessness that she's had up to that moment. And she's just absolutely bossing it. I can't explain how satisfying that scene was uh, or that, you know, all those scenes put together. Incredible, so well built up, built up over, you know, well, 12 books really like insane. And Egwin was really the first one who said she wanted to be Aes Sedai as well. She was the first to accept out of our two rivers people that it is what it is and that's what they're gonna do. So, so well written, 12 books for me, like a year a culmination of a storyline. And there's more left, you know? Even if her storyline ended there, with that scene, I would have thought, you know, wow, perfect. But there's more, lucky me. So once she's back in the rebel camp, she masterfully uses Varen's information and destroys a lot of the Black Aja over there. Doesn't quite manage to do that back in the White Tower when she's elected Emelian. And the Emelian scenes where she's elected Emelian were great because there was no change. She had already been the Emil and C for quite a while, maybe like a book and a half, two books, not by title, but just was like she is the Emil and C. So watching her go about and handle everything that she had to do was just so satisfying because it's everything that we've seen happening so far already and everyone else has been resisting against and we just see you just Egwin absolutely smash it. So proud. Go Eggy. And although there's been massive chunks of this uh, story where I haven't liked Egwin, I'll be honest, a lot of the time when she was with the wise ones doing apprenticeship, I didn't think she was very nice to her friends. I thought that when she was in power or had power over people, she was quite arrogant, um, just not very likable. But it's hard for me to look at anyone else and say they've done more than Egwin has now. Yes, Rand has done a lot. Perrin has done a lot. Um, Matt has done a lot. And if we look at Rand, especially, you know, he's done absolutely crazy things that aren't really gonna be able to be matched. But Egwin is not Tavaren. She's just a girl from Two Rivers. And she's done all of this. Like, it's hard to argue against her not being the most impressive character with regards to development, storyline, growth. Yeah, I just don't see how anyone beats her right now. But obviously, there's more to come. So other things that happens, a beautiful scene where Swan um bonds gareth brine and i've been saying gareth burn and i was corrected by someone in the comments and i couldn't believe it i was like no way but yeah it's gareth brine a trick of the eyes um that was a beautiful scene uh, to see how much they cared about each other how much they loved each other and gareth brine really is a great character just someone you can depend on so that was lovely i really enjoyed that scene and then we have a lady captured. I'd love to say that I'm satisfied, but I'm not. I don't think anyone deserves to be leashed. Like, it's absolutely horrible. Obviously, it's slavery. But slavery in a weird way where they demand, absolutely demand, just all of your brain. Like, there's nowhere to hide because they can feel all of your thoughts through the Adem, punish you in ways that are completely unnatural. And I just don't think anyone, you know, deserves that. The same way I didn't believe that Galena deserved to just spend the rest of her life being an absolute 100% slave to, uh, was it Thurava? Whew, gives me shivers just thinking about it. What a miserable, miserable existence. You know, you'd rather die, obviously, but you know, too late for her. We might get more later, who knows? I believe the Aes Sedai would strike back at the Shaun Chan. There's no way they're gonna let that go. No way they're gonna let that go. And I'm excited for a unified um, Aes Sedai and you know, whatever happens to the Shaun Chan. You know, I just I just can't see them brokering a deal where Rand allows that to happen and the Aes Sedai are just like, yeah, okay, no worries. We'll be friends for now. I know the last battle is important, but yeah, it's going to be interesting. And to be fair, we still haven't addressed that every single person who holds the leash can channel. Like that's surely going to rock the Sean Chan. But I don't know if we have time. We've only got two books left. We'll see what happens. Final thing I wanted to bring up is Masana. Masana is still in the White Tower, I can feel it. Even though everybody had to do the oaths over again, I just feel like she found a way to get past that or maybe leave and come back, so. And I still don't know who Masana is. I've got absolutely no clue, so we'll see. So I normally have a question um, and my only question for you this time is, is there a book from one to 12, obviously not including 13 and 14 because I haven't read them, that is more action packed and more satisfying than this one? And the problem is, it's taken so long to read these books that it's hard for me to rem remember, but I've been absolutely stunned at the end of a few different books, but I just don't think any of them are as jam-packed and action-packed 
as this one is. So, you know, uh, I think recency bias is definitely real. Every time I finish a book, minus, you know, one or two, I always think like, this is the best in the series so far. So you tell me, uh, as people who've probably read it a long time ago and reread it a few times, is there a book from one to 12 that feels more satisfying or more action-packed or more like we reached a conclusion than book 12? And finally, what's to come? So I think the next book is gonna be very Matt and Perrin heavy. Um, I think that Perrin still has a ways to go to accept himself as a leader of people. You know, if we went to the final battle now, he would be the least comfortable being a leader. Um, so there's that. Matt still needs to go to the Tower of Genji. He also kind of needs to consolidate his position with Tuan and, and those two need to meet back up with Rand as well. If that happens next book, maybe that'll be in the 14th book. Um, we also need to deal with the Asherman. The Asherman still haven't been dealt with and that is absolutely massive. So there's some amazing storylines still to come. Please like and subscribe. I absolutely love going on this journey with you guys and have an amazing day.